For five years, I broadcast regular weekly programs on murder. And over that whole time, I still didn't get round to looking at this country's most familiar professional villains, serving life sentences for killing the opposition. During those five years, I was frequently approached by strangers in pubs who said, You write about crime, do you? Why don't you write about me? I used to work for the Cray Twins. Five years in which I came to wonder whether half a generation of Londoners worked for them, in which it seemed that one would always be seeing their familiar faces cropping up on T-shirts and sweatshirts, on the wrappers of new books by people who'd worked for them or against them, or ghosted their own recollections. Five years which included a major feature film about them and a steady undercurrent of feeling that surely by now Reggie might be safely released. During those five years, passers-by have stopped me when I'm telling guided walkers about the goings-on in the blind beggar and fervently asserted that the craze are not serving life sentences, only thirty years apiece. Only I'm right, of course. They are serving life sentences with a recommended minimum of thirty years before parole. Five years in which the two likely lads from Bethnal Green came to seem almost lovable emblems of the sixties. Not quite as lovable as Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis, but like those two heroines of the box spring mattress, tarnished symbols of the genuine easing of old class divisions and taboos that was among the wonderful aspects of the great decade. So why did the craze have to wait all that time for the pleasure of my attention? Well, there isn't a single simple attitude one can take to them. Consider some of the varying views I've heard about them from people who were familiar with them in their heyday. Very good governors. Always treated me very well indeed. This from a perfectly respectable middle-aged gentleman who had been employed by them as an accountant in the more or less legitimate club-owning side of their work. Not, I presume, the accountant who Reg says helped them hide their illegal earnings and fiddle their income tax, until, sated with ripping off the state, he ripped off the twins and scarpered abroad. But another view came from a good friend of mine who was a schoolgirl in Stoke Newington at the time, and whose father ran a garment-making business in Hackney. All completely unconnected with the criminal world or the flash spielers and billiard halls where the twins made their mark in the East End. But from dear Leslie I heard, Oh, the Cray twins. Yes, they were poncing about all over East London as if they owned the place in those days. You couldn't miss them. And from a very hard man a professional villain of the next generation. The craze. People call them thieves' ponces, because they never did their own work themselves. That younger generation of villains, too, is unimpressed by the craze's persistent claim that the East End was a more decent place in their day, that mugging old ladies and gang-banging teenage girls would never have been tolerated. Indeed, the craze themselves enforced punitive justice on rapists. Now, today's professional villains are no more sympathetic than the craze to sexual violence, and perhaps even more likely to duff up rapists in prison. But they say that Reggie Cray doth protest too much about his own virtues in maintaining peaceful streets, and ask pointedly why this man of Robin Hood-like gallantry became very close to a granny basher in Parkhurst whom most decent thieves despised.
But conversely again, a very sympathetic opinion came from a friend who, as a young man, found himself at a party where the twins turned out unexpectedly to be the guests of honour. A party where a row broke out over one of Ronnie Cray's young men, and Reggie found himself in a brawl where, for once, he was getting rather the worst of it. Whereupon Ronnie rushed in to his help, completely overpowered his assailant, and administered such a savage beating, even by the ruthless standards of East End criminals, that his shocked friends dragged him off. And Ronnie, pulling himself together, said touchingly gently, with tears of apology standing in his eyes, but he's my brother. Don't you see? He's my brother. Yet how different again was young Donald Rumbelow's perception of Ronnie Cray when, as a city policeman, he was on duty at his trial. And there, as one of the witnesses gave damning evidence against the firm, Donald saw Ronnie stop making notes, look over his spectacles at the man in the witness box, and try to silence him with a stare from reptilian eyes bearing a malicious threat that seemed to Donald the purest evil he had ever seen. And this view perhaps is supported by the cold fury both twins express about practically all old members of their firm, with the honourable exceptions of their brother Charlie and Scotchy and Barry, since these men, who had been employed and paid by the twins, wickedly betrayed them and told the authorities the truth when they were arrested. So, which personal view should I take to report on the Cray twins? Straightforward, rather brash businessmen, good to work with. Poncily pretentious attention seekers, falsely claiming to have kept Mile End and Bethnal Green safe for the old and weak. Desperately devoted twin siblings, quite unable to think rationally if either saw a threat to the other. Men of calculating deadliness, who would willingly kneecap anyone who crossed them. Which view? should I put to you, confident that it represented as near as I could come to the truth. The books about them don't seem to make everything crystal clear either. At the time of their downfall, it happened that they were willingly encouraging a professional author, John Pearson, to write their lives. What would that book have been like if Superintendent Leonard Reed's special squad hadn't succeeded in convicting the twins. We'd presumably have had a book about a pair of rough diamonds who'd collected a few convictions and made a few enemies on their way up, but ended as successful club owners and friends of the famous. The libel laws would have stopped Pearson from calling them ongoing out-and-out -out villains. The book certainly couldn't have been the best seller that Profession of Violence became, giving a sound outline of the Cray's family background and career, whose main features have never been seriously challenged in subsequent revelations. But which of us would have cared about the lives of a couple of club owners, whom a few people might recall being described as gangsters when Lord Boothby indiscreetly let himself be photographed with one of them. But the lives and careers of two protection racketeers who had been convicted of one murder apiece and jointly acquitted of a third, who would undoubtedly have been hanged had their crimes and arrests taken place just four years earlier, who had been through the longest sequence of criminal trials and received the longest recommended minimum sentences ever handed out by the courts. These were lives that everybody wanted to know about. Still, one might doubt Pearson's real inwardness with his subjects. 
something of the original flattering whitewash job seems to remain. Uh, take his description of Bethnal Green. It appears to base itself on the green itself and the Jeffrey Museum area of 18th century merchant elegance. And not the dusty, dark and sordid locale of Valence Road and Cheshire Street and Tap Street, where the twins really lived and moved and had their being. So Pearson's analysis of their characters, though all we had to go on for several years, didn't seem quite good enough. He depicted Reginald Cray as a self-made, gifted and potentially successful businessman in any legitimate sphere, sadly drawn into constant criminal violence because of his dedicated attachment to his unhappily paranoid twin. Police memoirs, of course, offered a quite different view. These were men of unmitigated evil, holding the entire East End under their sway of sheer terror. These were men who could casually walk into a pub, shoot an enemy sitting at the bar in full view of everyone, confident that no one would ever dare to give evidence against them. These were men whose persistent bribery, threats and actual violence had been used to corrupt the jury system, so that even if they could ever be brought to court, some juror intimidated by the very real threat of violence to his family, would certainly break the necessary unanimity which it took to convict. These were men for whom capital punishment was almost too good. Scotch Jack Dixon, the driver who took Ronnie Cray and Ian Barry to and from the murder of George Cornell comes close to the police view. These were men whose sophisticated appearance and offer of easy money led him and his naive friend Barry, newly down from Edinburgh, into a world of criminal violence where both were soon out of their depth. They could cope with putting the bite on club owners who failed to come up with their dues, they could not accept the twins' mad and dangerous rages, fits of manic violence in which Reg showed himself quite as disturbed as the notoriously unbalanced Ron. Charlie Cray, the twins' elder brother, wrote his memoir and fully confirmed Pearson's description of the familial closeness of the Greys. Indeed, one thing one can say at once is that they provide a model answer to all those moralists who declare that the decay of decent traditional family standards is the cause of any alleged social and ethical decay. The twins' parents stayed together till death did them part, despite often trying circumstances. Both loved and, to the best of their ability, educated and encouraged their children in the ways of life they knew and understood. In fact, Mrs. Violet Cray is praised by everyone who knew her and has written about her. She certainly adored her twins, and they returned her love as excellent sons. They grieved deeply and genuinely for their parents when they died. And both the twins appear to have been deeply and seriously committed to their marriages. Odd, though Ron's post-prison marriage really is. But Reg suffered intense distress when his marriage broke up and his wife committed suicide. If as the moral majority sometimes asserts, decent old-fashioned respect for parents and commitment to marriage are needed for national regeneration, then we should fetch the Cray twins out of prison at once and give them positions of power and influence in the land. Alas, their domestic virtues only go to prove that, as the informed have always known, the home lives of professional criminals are likely to be far more edifying than the home lives of conservative cabinet ministers. But that does not mean that in any really important sense 
Ronald and Reginald Cray are better and more exemplary human beings than David Meller and Cecil Parkinson. When the twins came out with our story, as told to Fred Dynage, something very odd emerged. After a rather teasing account of their careers and crimes with very little new information, the book collapsed in what seemed to be accidentally very self-condemnatory personal statements. Reg whinged about the length of his sentence and whimpered that it would have been kinder to top him. Ron burst into balmy swaggering about his power and importance in the East End criminal world and the false rank of the Colonel, which he had bestowed on himself. Both seemed hopelessly out of touch with reality and best left locked up where they were. Not surprisingly, Reg has since said that the book did not satisfy them, that it went through too many editorial hands and lost its original truth to their nature. And so he has separately given us his own story and asserted his gratitude to be alive and his unstinting opposition to capital punishment and to war and indeed it seems to any form of killing at all except that which he and his colleagues find necessary as a way of conducting their business. And finally, Tony Lambrianu, convicted with them and a prominent figure among the later recruits to the firm, has written his own memoirs. He tries very hard to offend no one who counts in the underworld. The grasses who gave evidence against the Cray firm are all slags. The marks who were conned or threatened into handing over large sums of money to the firm all deserved to be milked. The murder victims deserved to die, even if the manner of their going was a little spontaneous and unplanned. The convicted murderers and conspirators, who didn't do exactly what the prosecution alleged down to the last detail, were pathetic victims of wicked miscarriages of justice, deliberately railroaded by the lying effing filth and their lying effing rat fink stool pigeons. Conversely, the lies those murderers and conspirators told to save their own skins were sensible stratagems and cunning wiles that the Homeric hero Odysseus might have applauded. Indeed, where other people have made their own genuine confessions and he cannot be accused of grassing. Lambrianu is now willing to tell the truth himself and concede that the confessions are true. So far, so bad, but so hopelessly typical, too, of the traditional criminal ethic. Bent, distorted, self-interested and self-deluding. But we should all probably be like that if we'd all been brought up in neighbourhoods or families where such standards are taken for granted. But there's one position Lambrianu does hold strongly, and it seems to bring us close to the truth about the craze and their murders. We need not share the value he places on it. We need not accord the firm the respect he gives it when he asserts that there will never be another like it. There will never be a criminal partnership like Ron and Reg again. But they were really unique, as he says. They were something new, something special, in that they made a success of crime, largely by making that success highly public. He's got something there. Something which will lead us effectively into their lethal story of professional villainy. The feature film, The Craze, was criticised when it came out for being too violent and unrealistically violent at that. The twins, it could be pointed out, did not draw sabres from their trouser legs and carve up rivals with them. They did not, as young men in the fairground boxing booth, get carried away by bloodlust into savaging each other. 
They didn't kill George Cornell with their jeering entourage urging them on. EastEnders, too, say Bethnal Green just didn't feel like that in their day. The filmmakers' argument that they knew they'd altered facts, they just wanted to show what the place felt like in the 1960s, was firmly declared to have failed. Yet one thing that film brought out superbly. The amazing and paradoxical contrast between the close, warm, affectionate family life, dominated by their mother and aunts, which clasped the Cray twins in its bosom all their lives, and the contrasting, cold, competitive gangland world in which they throve and made their mark. Ronald and Reginald Cray were born on the 25th of October, 1933. Reginald was slightly the elder. Their birthplace was Hoxton, a parish they soon left, and for which they never felt any affection. Valence Road, Bethnal Green, was to be home for the East End's most notorious twins. The long road runs down from Cheshire Street to the Whitechapel Road, near where the Whitechapel Pavilion once stood, and Wainwright the Murderer's Brush Shop. On the other side of Whitechapel Road was Wainwright's warehouse, backing into Vine Court, where he'd buried his drunken mistress in the 1870s. New Road continues the line of Valence Road south till it reaches Cable Street and forms a crossroad with its continuation down to St George's in the East Church as Cannon Street Road. Under that crossroads... The suicide John Williams was buried with a stake through his heart after he'd been found hanging in his cell subsequent to his arrest for the brutal Ratcliffe Highway murders of 1811. I doubt whether the Cray twins' reputation will eclipse the local memory of the Ratcliffe horrors, though I personally find the Valance, after whom Valance Road was named, pretty well as horrible as the assassins who surround his eponymous street. It was Baker's Row in Jack the Ripper's day, oh, for it runs through his territory too. It was renamed in honour of a clerk to the Board of Guardians, whose claim to fame was that he never let the Board overspend its miserable official welfare budget. Really a frightful reputation to leave in the East End, where George Lansbury and the whole of Poplar Council had gone to prison rather than starve the poor on the mean government dole laid down by the stony-hearted bureaucrats of Whitehall. The East End where Clement Attlee's social work and mayoralty had laid the moral foundations in experience for the second, and in most East Enders' view, the greatest of the three revolutionary governments of our century. But 178 Valence Road, if it still stood, would undoubtedly have its visitors to gape at the much-loved home of Britain's best-known organised crime leaders. Fortress Valence, the twins called this house, where they felt safe with their parents. Their mum especially. Their Aunt Rose, her sister, was next door at 176, and their Aunt May, another door away, at 174. Their father, Charles Cray, was a totter, and, by Reg's account, a good one. He took the boys on rounds with him when they were old enough, and he taught them to show perfect manners and real consideration for the anxieties of nervous, lonely housewives when they knocked on their doors for old clothes or valuables. He taught them, too, how to make a good deal in buying or selling old gold and silver, he set them the example of daily shaving, by no means a common local habit, and wearing a suit whenever a good impression was needed. The young men's respectful manner to their elders and gallant courtesy to ladies would ease their path through life for a long time, and even though I know they were living by violence and terror, 
I must admit to finding the famous photograph of them politely shaking hands with neighbours who'd come out to congratulate them after an acquittal in 1965, a very impressive image. I feel I should have liked these clean-cut, well-turned-out, grateful and seemingly diffident young men who are so thankful to their poorer and less well-dressed neighbours for their sympathy and support. Their good manners and gallantry were further encouraged when the war came and their mother took control of their upbringing. Charles Cray, like many another East Ender, felt that a government which had done precious little for him had no right to ask him to risk his life for it when it couldn't keep the peace with other states. He went on the run from the army call-up and spent the war with the sympathetic support of friends, relatives and neighbours hiding from the police. At times it even seems as though the police themselves shared the view that the bomb-barrage denizens of the East End really didn't owe their overlords the misery of being shot at as well. It's hard to explain otherwise how one copper could have let Charles escape in his obvious hiding place in the outside privy by restricting his search to the muttered comment, No, he wouldn't be hiding in there. Mrs. Violet Cray took on the essential work of bringing up the twins and their elder brother Charlie throughout the war. Everyone who met her, even former Cray associates who've turned against the twins and gave evidence against them, everyone speaks well of her. She was lively, courageous, splendidly hospitable and devoted to her twins. She turned them out well encouraged them to feel that they were essentially lovable, saw that they didn't cut school too blatantly. Even by the standards of their own generation, the twins showed a rather old-fashioned gallantry toward women. While their normal conversation was full of effing and blinding, they would never tolerate anyone using profanity in female company. As grown men, they would use club prostitutes and gangland groupies quite unfeelingly to provide a bit of nookie for friends and colleagues on the lam. But they despised all but the richest pimps and ponces, and they believed that their friends' wives, sisters and mothers must be treated like Madonnas, the plaster virgin kind, not the erotic pop singer kind. They never let their adored mum see any of the violence by which they lived, or know any details of their criminal activities. Men with this sort of unrealistic old-fashioned machismo usually have mothers whom they view as enshrined saints, and who they presumably imagine gave birth to them by single-cell parturition or some such lust-free mechanism. Yet it may be that the most important influence on the course their lives would take was not their mother at all, but their elder brother, Charlie. Slightly overshadowed, one feels, by the fuss showered on the twins, he nevertheless managed not to resent his intrusive younger siblings, and he taught them to box. Their grandfather, a notable local character with gypsy blood, had been a boxer and the twins followed in the family footsteps. Boxing was the only thing at which they excelled at school. Both came out with amateur junior titles. Reggie's proudest moment in his boyhood was when he looked at all London spreading away around him and knew that he was the school's champion of all this. They both loved scrapping. They both acknowledged Charlie's importance in teaching them almost every piece of ring craft they knew. And they both took their fighting skills and some practices that the Marquis of Queensbury thought he had stamped out onto the streets. Kids in the East End have always had to be able to look after themselves. 
It is not a society that is tolerant of softy Walter and his ilk. So just to survive in the playground, prepubescent boys had better know how to put the boot in. When my son was at a primary school in Stoke Newington, I had to warn him before his return to Barbados that he'd start something pretty well akin to a race riot if he kicked anybody black in a fight out there. It is an absolute taboo associated with treating slaves like animals and not men. But I certainly did not try to promote my own Christian pacifist principles in a seven-year-old who had to survive among his peer group in the Cray Twins' old stamping ground. Ron and Reg quickly became known as the toughest kids on the block. Their first appearances in court were for violence, GBH charges following a gang fight on which they were acquitted, and assaulting a policeman for which they were put on probation. They took the tough, cocky view that anybody standing up to them was taking a liberty. Anybody in a uniform thereby made the liberty diabolical. Now, I had long felt that a real peculiarity of the craze was their emergence in their early twenties as fully-fledged protection racketeers capitalising on their reputation for toughness without ever going through the long apprenticeship in theft which is the normal route to professional criminality. The great gangsters of America, Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel and Maya Lansky, all started out as thieves and attracted the attention of their elders and worsers in criminal circles by their success in warehouse breaking and hijacking and armed robbery. Albert Harding, the twins' predecessor as an East End Gentile gang leader records in his memoirs that he started out as a thief. Jack Comer, better known as Jack Spot, one of their models as a ferocious London-wide Mr. Big, has armed robbery writ large on his criminal record. But the twins, surprisingly, seemed never to have been thieves at all. I'm sure they wouldn't care tuppence what I think about their criminal careers, and why should they? But they may well respect their own kind. And so I was very interested when I learned in Parkhurst that some villains called the craze thieves' ponces, because they only did a little receiving, never any of the basic stealing, which is, and always has been, the heart and soul and bulk of criminal activity. It may be that Reggie Cray has overheard this criticism. And so, in his memoirs, he recounts several episodes in their teens when he and Ron went robbing. Not robbing with violence, just robbing. I've no reason to suppose he's lying. It remains interesting, however, that it was so small a part of their joint career. As the 1950s opened, the twins became liable for national service. Like Malcolm X, they were quite sensible enough to recognise that the profession of arms requires a kind of dedication and commitment that they entirely lacked. That it makes as much sense to try to forcibly make soldiers by compulsory conscription as it would to try to make monks or musicians. They set about to secure themselves dishonourable discharge in the fastest possible time, ridiculing military authority as far as they could while they did so. They would have been willing to serve as PT instructors, but they would not be mere squaddies. And when they found the army would not let them dictate their own military careers, they got stroppy. They hit NCOs who annoyed them. They used a favourite old trick from school days, using their identical appearance to confuse authority. They went AWOL with fellow delinquents. They did everything in their power to get swiftly and dishonourably kicked out. 
and in the course of their cheeky ups and downs, Ronnie started to behave on occasion in eccentric ways which just might not have been conscious misbehaviour. It faintly occurred to him and those close to him that he just might not always have a perfect hold on reality. But at last, the twins found themselves back on Civvy Street. With the skills of ring boxers, street scrappers, and petty villains to see them through life. They met Jack Spot and Billy Hill, the crime kings of London in the 1950s. Though Spot was a fellow East Ender, a Jewish scrapper who had honed his street fighting abilities on Mosley's fascists in the 1930s, it was the suave bookmaker Hill who really impressed them, and he accepted them as useful occasional muscle, and a couple who could be relied upon to turn up with a gun in hand should an emergency arise. But they wanted some independent business front of their own as well. They were not content merely to be someone else's goons. Their first acquisition was a billiard hall in Mile End. And here, Reggie, at least, realised that his metier was to be a club owner. While Ron scrapped his way into a prison sentence for GBH, Reg acquired another club in Bow, which he named the Double R Club. Elder brother Charlie helped with the business side. Part of the profits were set aside for Ronnie when he should be released. And Reg knew that he really wanted to spend a goodly part of his life greeting customers and friends at the door of more or less sophisticated drinking and gambling premises. Several observers have suggested that he might have been an excellent legitimate club owner businessman had he not been tied to his neurotic twin. But Reg, who has a touching capacity for loyalty and openness when it suits him, has remarked that one of a pair of twins always gets tagged the bad boy. In the Craze case, this was wrong. And others have remarked that Reg was capable of throwing just as violent a tantrum as his brother when he was crossed, and probably started even more violent and unnecessary incidents. Still, while Ron was in prison, the authorities noted for the first time that he suffered from serious paranoia that at times he suffered from a perfectly genuine delusion that those around him were plotting to kill him. As a natural fighter, Ronnie's inclination was to hit at them first. And so he could be, quite innocently, extremely dangerous unless he had medication to keep him on an even keel. He spent some time in hospitalised security, and it took a well-calculated jailbreak to put the authorities in a punitive frame of mind so that they declared him sane enough to be punished when he was retaken. Ergo, he was sane enough to be released when his sentence was up. The escape was engineered as one of the twins' cheeky jokes on authority. They used their identical appearance to let Ron make his jailbreak by going out in the persona of Reg during a prison visit. When Ron was finally back on the streets, the serious business of building up the firm began. They acquired several more clubs, some in the East End, by the simple expedient of firebombing rival club owners and terrorising them out of business or into ripeness for a takeover. Neither the twins nor their henchmen show the faintest recognition that this form of business competition is totally unacceptable to their fellow citizens. While they rightly complain that 
the law's demands that villains show remorse seem like an overt invitation to Uriah Heapish humbug. They're also quite unaware that the rest of us are not prepared to tolerate the view that everyone in criminal circles understands that taking a liberty invites violent and injurious personal reprisals, let alone that the mere fact of owning a club within a mile of Cray Twins' property constitutes a diabolical liberty in itself. Reg is very anxious to downplay the extent to which protection racketeering was their business in the 1960s, recognising, I guess, that their unlicensed violence is the aspect of their activities that legitimate society finds quite unforgivable. So we'd better note that an admiring henchman from the second generation of the gang, Tony Lambrianu, makes no bones about the fact that the firm conducted a reign of terror in the East End, that like mafiosi, the twins intended to be men of respect, and respecting them meant knowing that if you crossed them or uttered a casual insult, you'd get shot in the leg or have your face carved open with a razor. Mr. Lambriano still sees this as perfectly reasonable and necessary under the circumstances. He's also quite open about the oddest feature of the Cray Gang, the twins' deliberate courting of publicity. This is a quite extraordinary thing for a criminal to do. The safest place for a serious villain is out of sight and out of mind. The twins were highly visible around the East End, making constant public donations to charities and boxing clubs. And when they acquired their club, Esmeralda's Barn, in Knightsbridge, with a gambling section and a lesbian club in the basement, they became an obvious and open part of the swinging sixties. They cultivated celebrities. Reg's memoirs make it clear that there was a genuine element of starry-eyed hero worship in their attitude, especially when they could invite a great boxer like Sonny Liston or a super-great boxer like Joe Lewis into their company. An East Ender like actress Barbara Windsor, herself married at one time to a local villain, was also a reasonable friend. I suppose the extraordinary left-wing politician Tom Dryberg, always skirting the margins of the law with his preposterous homosexual pickups in public lavatories, might just have met Ron, as it were, legitimately through gay circles, since Ron was open about his bisexuality from an early stage. But the senior conservative politician, Lord Boothby, pulled unnecessary scandal down on himself when he began to associate with them, and his own account of having been approached by the unknown Ronnie with a serious business proposition and naively letting himself be photographed with him was distinctly disingenuous, given that Boothby asked questions on Ronnie's behalf in the House of Lords. Still, despite persistent rumours, I strongly doubt whether Boothby had a homosexual tie with Ronnie. It would run too counter to the rampant and adulterous heterosexuality of all the rest of his life. But Diana Dawes, Christine Keeler, Judy Garland, and the otherwise unknown to me American singer Billy Daniels, now, these were people with whom the twins should only have been making glossily photographed public appearances if they really were innocent businessmen club owners. They were not. They were villains, protection racketeers, picking up pensions and sweets from small club owners. They were receivers by Reg's account. They were men who lived by violence and competed with rivals in violence. The use of a high profile to terrorise communities into silence, the use of threats and bribery to corrupt juries, 
something to which Rage has confessed in print. These activities meant that the police knew very well who they were and what they were up to. The claim that they could put 200 armed men on the streets, if necessary, was almost certainly exaggerated. But they were the most obvious gang leaders trying to turn 1960s London into some semblance of 1920s Chicago. They were men with whom the American Mafia actually considered doing business. They were men who had only to take one step too far and the edifice would cave in. And the glittering edifice was not all it seemed in any case. Esmeralda's Barn, the Knightsbridge Club that should have been their golden flagship, proved a loss and had to be flogged off pretty soon. Lord Howard of Effingham's name as co-director might persuade the twins they'd arrived. Nobody else thought they were anything more than the money and muscle they could command. And glitzy gangland London finally pulled its own roof in on itself by waging a lethal battle in South London. It was a battle that was intended to hit the craze, but only killed their cousin Richard Hart, as he was the only connection of theirs in Mr. Smith and the Witch Doctor. That night when the Richardson brothers and mad Frankie Fraser attacked the place, hoping to rub out the East Enders. The Crays and the Richardsons were competing for power in the West End, and the affray the Crays missed settled the power balance between them. But not in the way anyone could have predicted. Eddie and Charlie Richardson ruled crime in South London in the early 1960s. They came from Camberwell, an area which had long had its little criminal sector in the vicinity of Wyndham Road. There, James Greenacre chopped up Hannah Brown and made off with her jewellery for his mistress Sarah Gale in the 1830s, round about the time when Dickens was placing Bill Sykes and Nancy in lodgings close to the Cray twins' home in Bethnal Green. Neighbourhoods may often hand down a cultural tradition of despising the law, over several generations. Just as the Crays comprised one brother, Ronnie, who seemed centrally and naturally a gangland baron, and another, Reggie, who it seemed might have been a legitimate businessman under other circumstances, so the Richardsons appeared by nature a gangland boss, Eddie, and a slightly bent scrap metal and used car dealer, Charlie. The Crays had been relatively lucky in their patch on the inner East End. They established their reputation as street fighters after a tremendous brawl with some very tough Watney Street dockers. They concentrated on opening and taking over clubs and shaking down small club owners and never came into conflict with the old established criminal circles of Whitechapel and Spitalfields. While the police and the craze mentor Arthur Harding have implied that Arthur's great vendetta mob rumble with the leading gang of the time had left the East End stripped of gangs since 1910, after which underworld power passed to Darby Sabini's Clerkenwell-based mob, in fact, Arthur's great rival, Darkie the Coon Bogart, had gone quietly and unobtrusively about business which his heirs and assigns still continue. They didn't seek publicity. They didn't tangle with the flashy upstart craze. The gangland killings which took out Tommy Scarface Smithson and led to the pen club affray in Duval Street Spitalfields in the 1950s were much to do with Maltese mobsters fearing that some of Arthur Harding's successors wanted to muscle in on the prostitution, pornography and general sleaze trade that the Malts were making their own. The Crays openly and vociferously despised pimping. The only ponce for whom they had any respect 
was Eugene Messina, and they had no intention of running prostitutes themselves when club girls or gangland groupies were so easily available, free of charge, for them and their friends and employees. The Richardsons were a little less fortunate. They had rivals who, like Arthur Harding or Darby Sabini of old, thought that power in an underworld territory was best secured by open warfare, face-to-face -face open combat in selected pubs or clubs, with knives at least, shooters if necessary. And so, their habits of intense competitive violence were used to maintain discipline in their own mob and to terrorise others. George Cornell, one of their leading heavies, was supposed to be their main gang member, urging that the Richardsons take on the craze and wipe them out once and for all. But, of course, Cray loyalists have every reason to put Cornell in the worst light possible. Still, tension built up, and so it was, that Eddie and Charlie Richardson and mad Frankie Fraser turned up mob-handed at the Mr. Smith and the Witch Doctor drinking club in Rushy Green Road, Catford. Mad Frankie Fraser. Mad is, of course, a complimentary epithet for a violent criminal, implying that a truly berserk fury will greet anyone who crosses the man. Albeit, great villains with uncontrollably evil tempers like Bugsy or Bughouse Siegel have loathed the nickname, and the Cray twins, both of whom have had periods of hospitalization for mental disturbance, have never been flattered with it. Frankie Fraser, it has been suggested, really may have more personality problems than a mere penchant for uncontrolled violence. A couple of years ago, for example, when the now venerable Mr. Fraser was asked by the police who might have just tried to shoot him up outside Turnmill's disco in Clerkenwell, Frankie not only declined to tell them, he gave his name, apparently in all seriousness, as Tutankhamun. Back at Mr. Smith and the Witch Doctor Club in 1966, by all accounts, Eddie Richardson jumped onto a table and shouted, Nobody has a drink unless I say so! The few innocent civilians in the club scattered. The hoodlums hanging around there fought it out with enthusiasm. Eddie Richardson, Frankie Fraser, and two other villains were injured. The Cray's cousin, Richard Hart, the only associate of their firm who happened to be present, was left dead. This unedifying little incident had several untoward consequences. The East London car dealer, Ginger Marks, disappeared from Cheshire Street, Bethnal Green, where he had been supervising a burglary in the middle of one night. His hat and spectacles were politely returned to his widow. Four South London villains, said to have been seen to call Ginger from a slow-moving car, gun him down in the gutter in front of the carpenter's arms and speed away, taking the body with them, went on trial several years later. The judge dismissed the case after saying carefully that the police had been perfectly right to bring charges. What made it legally unsafe was that the witness who described the murder had formally professed to have seen nothing, only fear that he too might become a revenge victim in this war of the mobs led him to come forward belatedly with his story. Another consequence was that the police started to take unusually firm action to curb these unsavoury activities. Even the more sordid streets of Catford and Bethnal Green could not be allowed to become a bad version of an early Warner Brothers film. 
Although it proved impossible to charge anyone with the murder of Richard Hart, the Richardson gang suddenly found themselves arrested and the subjects of the sensational torture trial in which it was attested that they had held kangaroo courts to try enemies and traitors to the gang and had done dreadful things with electrical generators to the more soft and sensitive bits of the defendants. One of the Richardsons was even supposed to have dressed up in a mock judge's gown to give weight to these serious occasions. And another consequence of the Mr. Smith's Club affray was that the Cray twins now felt there was no alternative to direct confrontation with the rump of the Richardson mob. The villains all tended to drink at the same clubs and pubs up west, and whenever a group of the Cray firm had encountered a group of the Richardson's men over the last few months, there'd been a quick eyeing over the numbers of the opposition and a decision as to who would find discretion the better part of valour. It all seemed likely to spill over into outright public war on the old Derby Sabini lines, especially as there were some rich pickings from the pornography business in Soho at stake. And then, all of a sudden, the Richardsons were held responsible for killing the twins' cousin. Outright gang war seemed certain, yet before it could erupt, the police swooped. The Richardsons were arrested, and with them almost the entirety of their mob's senior membership. The only leading Richardson lieutenant remaining at large was George Cornell. Well, now, the Crays weren't going to make themselves look stupid by unleashing the full force of their best available muscle. Connie Whitehead and Big Pat Connolly and Ronnie Bender and Albert Donahue and Scotch Jack Dixon and Scotch Ian Barry and the Lambrianus and the rest. They weren't going to let them all loose on one man. It's been suggested that a meet was set up where the twins proposed to Cornell that with his colleagues all in police hands he might find it worth his while to work with the Greys. In particular to cut them in on that share of the porno rackets that his gang had controlled. Whether there was such a meet or not, it is widely and generally reported that Cornell rebuffed all overtures from the craze with contumely, and whether or not it was to his face, he certainly described Ronnie Cray as a fat poof, probably on more than one occasion. Once, indeed, humiliatingly, in the presence of visiting ambassadors from powerful foreign mobs. George had gone over the top. Ronnie was putting on weight, indeed. He administered more than one beating to men who ventured to comment rudely on the fact. And he did not disguise his sexual preference for young men. But his honour, the respect in which he needed to be held to retain his hold over tough underworld territory meant that he could not let the insult pass unavenged. And with George's South London compeers under lock and key, vengeance could be inflicted with impunity. The general attitude of the men who went to prison with Ronnie Cray seems to be that he was perfectly right that Cornell's insults constituted a liberty for which, local etiquette insisted, only life could compensate. We may set on one side as special pleading the claims that Cornell was personally the most obnoxiously brutal of a very brutal gang, and stupid with it. It is quite possible that Tony Lambrianu did, as he claims, once find Cornell driving golf balls at the mouth of a trussed-up victim, breaking all his teeth, when all the time the car that the victim was supposed to have purloined was in the local authority pound where the police had taken it for being wrongly parked. I don't suggest that Mr. Cornell was in any way known to me a nice or an admirable man. But I cannot possibly share Mr. Lambrianu's belief that his conduct justified Ronnie Cray's actions. Good gracious me, 
Are we to have villains with guns let loose on Ian Hislop and Paul Merton if public figures dislike the mockery heaped on them in private eye? And have I got news for you? The day after the summary arrest and detention of the leading Richardsonians for the Mr. Smith affray, Ronnie Cray summoned members of the Cray firm to a party at the Lion in Tap Street. This rather remote pub, in a back street beside railway arches north of Whitechapel Road, had replaced the more open setting of the Grave Morris pub beside Whitechapel Underground Station as the twins' favourite watering hole. The Lion, known to the firm as Madge's or The Widow's, in honour of a landlady who died a few years ago, boasted two separate bars, so that the firm could drink in one, and the local police they were entertaining to free drinks, as was their wont, could be out of sight in the other, instead of both groups having to look spuriously amiably at each other, as had been the case in the grave Morris. Furthermore, the widow allowed the firm the use of an upstairs room, for more private and confidential meetings, should they need it. Reggie Cray's own account of that evening doesn't seem to refute the suggestion made by others that he was not overjoyed by Ronnie's general comportment as people arrived and feared that some unnecessary trouble was going down. Who oh, it was that tipped Ronnie off that Cornell was in the Blind Beggar pub on the corner of Whitechapel Road and Cambridge Heath Road has never been recorded. Possibly it was common knowledge that he might be there. Cornell was in fact an East End man, despite having thrown in his lot with South Londoners. In any case, after a certain amount of conspiratorial whispering, Ronnie summoned Scotch Ian Barry, who had become his personal minder. He either checked that Barry was armed or passed a pistol to him. He then co-opted Barry's friend, Scotch Jack Dixon, as driver. The two Scotchmen were both ex-army and had come down from Edinburgh together to seek their fortune in the big smoke. An encounter with Cray firm collectors in Brick Lane clubs had brought them in touch with the brothers and they'd risen to positions of considerable bad eminence in the ranks of the ungodly. Since Dixon ultimately testified against the gang at their trials, while Barry stayed mute with his fellow defendants, the convicted mobsters have made considerable efforts to depict Dixon as a sleazy bully who always lied and cheated his way through life while Ian Barry is a noble and courageous soldier, true blue and loyal to his friends. Actually, I see no reason to doubt Dixon's claim that his long-term friend Barry was horrified to find himself involved in a murder, and the pair of them had got considerably out of the criminal depth they just might have intended when they came to London, even though they dealt with the problem in quite different ways. Dixon was one of the very few firm members who owned a car and could drive. Ronnie ordered him to take it from Tap Street to Valence Road, turn left on Whitechapel Road, and drive past the blind beggar onto Mile End Road. There he had to make a U-turn and bring the car back to park on the opposite side of the road from the pub. The railings down the middle of the road would make the whole general manoeuvre impossible today. Taking Barry with him, Ronnie ordered Dixon to wait while he went into the pub, saying he'd only be five minutes. Dixon expected Ronnie's five minutes to be an hour or more, and anticipated trouble with the police for being stopped on a busy road. But in five minutes, Cray and Barry came out again, Barry looking extremely pale. Ronnie ordered Dixon to drive back to the lion. And as they went down the Whitechapel Road, Dixon became aware that police cars with screaming sirens were making their way into the area. Today, everyone knows what happened in the blind beggar. Ronnie and Barry strode in. Cornell, who was drinking at the bar on the left side of the room, 
looked over and said, Look who's here. Ronnie shot him straight between the eyes, and he keeled over dead. Barry fired two shots into the ceiling. The barmaid screamed. Two brewery salesmen, who were quietly playing chess, hit the floor. The jukebox stuck in the groove of the tune it was playing. The sun ain't going to shine any more. And the assassins strode out and back to their car. Contradictory stories now start to emerge. The convicted villains have expressed great indignation at what they term the lies of Scotch Jack Dixon. There doesn't seem to be much support for the claim that Reggie responded to learning of the murder with the words, Ronnie does some funny things sometimes. Nor, I imagine, does Ronnie enjoy the claim that he indulged in the immature chant, I have done it, I have done it at last, on the way back. People who knew the twins are pains to deny that Ronnie took to telling Reggie, I've done mine, you've got to do yours. Thus inciting Reg to become a murderer himself. But this is all typical villain's indignation. A man was dead because he called a stout poof a fat poof. It was rude, ignorant and prejudiced of him. But the murder was outrageous. The men responsible and their associates, meanwhile, are far more angry that the I's were not dotted nor the T's properly crossed at their trial. The police, thank goodness, got their priorities right. Although Ronnie was rushed off into hiding with a bath and an immediate change of clothes to eliminate all traces of gunpowder or possible blood, a few pounds were handed over to the publican, some gifts and threats were offered to the barmaid and the brewery salesman, and detectives were confronted with a case of cold-blooded shooting in front of witnesses who all said they saw nothing at all, although this was all that confronted the police. They were determined to put an end to it. If the craze got away with that, there would be a reign of terror indeed. From now on, there would be a strong party in the Metropolitan Police absolutely convinced that their first duty was to bring the Cray twins' careers to an end. And when, a year later, the twins' apparent immunity from punishment for the brutal slaying in the blind beggar had given them still further confidence and arrogance, they proceeded to organise a cheeky jailbreak for a friend who promptly disappeared in sinister circumstances. Thereafter, an overwhelming majority of the police were willing to see precious resources turned over to ending this menace. Perhaps, only perhaps, the twins might have been out enjoying their clubs today. If only they could have resisted showing off their power by the abduction of the mad axeman. Four years ago, the English writer Derek Raymond monopolised a panel discussion in Grenoble, where I was appearing, with a splendidly cynical and well-informed series of diatribes in English and fluent French on Jack the Ripper and the villainy of the police. Under his real name, Robin Cook, Derek Raymond is France's favourite English thriller writer though in this country his brilliantly harsh and cynical hard-boiled cop novels are published over the name Derek Raymond to distinguish him from the other Robin Cook, who writes scientific thrillers. But Derek Raymond's real name is Robin Cook, and France has taken him to its heart. He writes books that could be scenarios for their own beloved film noir. He lives in the French countryside, dressing in black with a little beret. And as an old Etonian, who once ran an illegal gaming club, he has just the right classy and racy background to please literate French Romain Policier fans. It was during his phase as an illegal gambling club operator that Robin came across Frank Mitchell, 
about whom he tells a splendid story. It can be hard enough for legitimate bookmakers to collect gambling debts if they've been taken on credit, for the law refuses to intervene in disputes between gentlemen over wagers. A casino banker outside the law would never collect anything he was owed without resort to heavies. And so Robin came to know people like Frank Mitchell, a five-foot-eleven standing villain with a fetish for physical fitness, enormous strength, and a career in armed robbery and intimidation. I expect he wasn't much more thuggish than many of the prefects Robin had known at Eton. But employing thugs has the drawback that they know you and know when you may have money in your possession. And so Robin was resigned to his misfortune when Frank Mitchell breezed cheerfully into his flat one day and asked if he wanted to buy a new car. Wouldn't take no for an answer. Snatched up a couple of grand that lay on the tables as the previous night's takings, amiably tossed Robin a car key and waltzed out. Robin a small, neat, and I think non-violent man, sighed, put on a pair of gloves, drove the brand new car parked outside his door rapidly to a back street and left it there with the keys locked inside. He didn't want himself or his fingerprints to be involved with receiving Frank Mitchell's latest piece of stolen goods. The Cray twins' biographer, John Pearson, tells a much sadder story about Frank Mitchell's induction into criminal society. An overgrown, not very bright child with bullying tendencies, Frank was blessed with an honest and responsible father who was determined not to let the boy fall into bad ways. When little Frank beat up another child and stole his tricycle, Mr. Mitchell decided his son must be taught a lesson. He marched him down to the local police station, confident that a serious wigging from uniformed authority would make the point better than he could himself. But the police, with the utter madness of those old days when all the educated and the official were quite sure Sure, they knew what was good for ordinary folks better than they could themselves. The police didn't stop at a lecture and a warning. They arrested little Frank, had him put through juvenile court and placed in care, taken away from the excellent father who cared so seriously for him, and put him into a peer group who rapidly taught him that crime was an acceptable way of life. Frank never looked back. He spent half the rest of his life in a series of institutions and prisons. And in his times of freedom, he earned his living by theft and violence. Yet almost everyone who knew him saw him as a potentially gentle giant, with a sunny disposition, who could be easily commanded by anyone he thought had been really kind to him, easily charmed by anyone who would laugh at his practical jokes, easily friendly with anyone who flattered him on his enormous strength. Along the line, he collected the nickname of the Mad Axeman. This followed a jailbreak, when he hid out in an elderly couple's cottage and used an axe lifted from their shed to terrorise them. I should make it clear, Frank Mitchell never killed anyone with an axe, at least as far as I know. But... The nickname was not really conducive to the public regarding him as a lovable rogue. After one of his prison escapes in the 1960s, Private Eye had a cover photograph of some sort of action on Dartmoor, I've forgotten what now, with tiny figures all over the place and speech bubbles coming from several of them. The one I've always remembered parodies the old newspaper circulation building Lobby Ludd feature, with a bubble saying to another figure, You are the Mad Axeman, and I claim the News Chronicle Prize. The Mad Axeman encountered the Cray twins separately in prisons. Mitchell was quite a jailhouse hero. 
He was so big and strong that it could take up to eleven warders to overpower him. And on the way to victory, several of them were likely to suffer broken bones. Frank had the alarming habit of seizing guards in an amiable bear hug. If he was in a good humour, he would simply lift his captor off his feet and put him down again. If he really had the hump with the man, he would quietly crack a rib before letting him go. And according to Tony Lambrianu, several screws so feared the ungentle giant's possible reprisals that they did not report these assaults with GBH, preferring to have themselves treated on the QT and forego any sick leave. Frank was also hugely popular with the inmates at one prison, where he always picked up an unpopular governor on his rounds and carried him aloft. The official obviously loathed this mock homage, but dared not protest for fear of serious injury. The craze liked Frank, and Frank liked the craze. Ronnie, especially, was an intelligent criminal who never took liberties, used his brains for the benefit of the fraternity that included Frank, and was a boss the strong man could respect. The twins were always considerate of colleagues who were enjoying long holidays at Her Majesty's expense, and included prison visits and gifts to professional London criminals in jail among their less publicised charities. By 1966, Frank Mitchell appeared to be a pretty permanent inmate of Dartmoor. His escapes and his nickname made him the sort of alarming figure most citizens want locked well out of their way. And Frank was starting to feel intensely aggrieved that although he had never been convicted of any murder, he was offered no parole date, and it seemed as though he might spend the rest of his life behind bars. This was not a future he regarded with equanimity, although his durance vile was far removed from confinement to a loathsome dungeon. Indeed, when the facts about Frank's time in Dartmoor emerged, even the most liberal commentators felt that some prison reform in the direction of greater severity was required, for Frank enjoyed a remarkable degree of freedom. He was assigned to an outside work party and quickly established the position that whenever he wanted, he would skive off to a pub in Princeton for a pint and a pasty. Not only did his guards connive at these expeditions, he would even use one to keep cavy for him. Whether he achieved this power over his jailers by threats and intimidation or by bribery through powerful outside friends like the Crays, History does not relate, but it was hardly a desirable state of affairs. He was also able to enjoy intimate female company from time to time. If he picked up a pretty local girl in the pub who was not averse to a tumble on the moors, his guards would cast a blind eye while nature took its course. And once at least, it is suggested, the craze made arrangements to send down firm members with a classy picnic lunch for Frank and a hooker for postprandial entertainment. But with all these privileges, Frank was nonetheless fretting at the lack of a parole date. And in December 1966, the craze felt sufficiently powerful to take sensational steps to help him. They were riding very high at that time. After Ronnie and Ian Barry had gone to ground following the murder of George Cornell, even spending a period in Tangier with the old gang boss Billy Hill, it was apparent that the law could do nothing effective. Essentially, everyone in the East End knew Ronnie Cray had simply walked into the blind beggar pub and shot Cornell dead as he sat there, and not one of the material witnesses was prepared to testify. The twins had grown increasingly violent in the indulgence of their own bad temper. Even before the Cornell murder, Reggie had shot his principal minder 
Albert Donoghue, in the leg when he lost patience with him. Since the murder, a former firm associate called Nobby Clark, who had been shaken down by the twins and then failed to prevent a petty villain called Jack McVitty from absconding with part of the shakedown, had been knocked up and pulled from his bed to be shot in the foot in his own house. At least one club owner was also shot in the leg when he didn't come up with as much protection money as the firm expected. The twins were behaving as though they were invulnerable. And the plot to force a parole date for Frank Mitchell would give a really cheeky twist to the law's tale. An apparently humane action that would do no one any harm. The plan was to spring the axeman from jail and keep him in hiding while he sent letters to the newspapers offering to give himself up again just as soon as he was told when he might apply for parole. The first part of the plan was a piece of cake. Frank's allocation to outside work parties and virtual control of his guards meant that he could be reached as and when was convenient. In fact, the pickup took place at Bagger Tor on the 12th of December. Big Albert Donahue drove down to Dartmoor with Joe Williams and rushed straight back to London. Frank was probably safely in hiding before a call over back at the prison had even established that he was missing. The twins placed their guest in a safe house. Like the Secret Service, they always favoured quiet suburban dwelling places for hideouts of real secrecy. When the heat was on, for one reason or another, they would usually go to ground in flats in Finchley or Leighton, bored out of their minds while in hiding, but able to take stock while other members of the firm bribed or intimidated potentially dangerous witnesses. Frank Mitchell was taken to Barking. The flat the twins used belonged to an East End bookstall holder called Lenny Dunn. According to Scotch Jack Dixon, Lenny was promised £500 for the use of his premises, and he was never paid. And with Mitchell safely hidden away from the frantic police search all over London and the West Country, the great prank started to go sour. Scotch Jack Dixon, Big Albert Donoghue, Mad Teddy Smith and ex-boxer Billy Exley were the firm members and associates delegated to help Lenny Dunn look after the fugitive. Tony Lambrianu drove Dixon out to Barking, where Donoghue was undertaking the first shift. Already he and Dunn doubted whether Frank would be quite so willing to turn himself in once given a parole application date, as he had formerly indicated. This was bad news. As nobody wanted a lifetime of responsibility for the big man, and he was really too simple to be chucked out and left to fend for himself. Teddy Smith helped Frank draft his letters to the newspapers. This was no easy task, as penmanship and composition were not among the skills that had made Frank the man he was. It took about twenty writing pads before satisfactory epistles for dispatch to The Times and The Daily Mirror were complete. Then Frank complained that he needed a woman, and if one weren't supplied for him, he'd go out and look for one. According to Scotch Jack Dixon, Ronnie Cray, himself in hiding at the time, was furious when he heard this request and complained that the caper was already costing the firm thousands. It's hard to see how that could be, really. Even the hire of an expensive car for the trip to Dartmoor and back, coupled with any necessary bribery of prison officials, couldn't have amounted to that much. But Randy Frank couldn't be allowed to rattle around East London like a loose cannon. An accommodating club girl called Blonde Lisa was dispatched to Barking with her little overnight bag. Lisa was a very pleasant and good-natured young lady. She liked Frank and felt sorry for him. 
No doubt it helped that he was good-looking, kept his body in Charles Atlas trim, and was scrupulously clean, getting up to brush his teeth repeatedly during the night. Furthermore, despite his great bulk and the many years' sexual deprivation which made him, in her words, an absolute stallion going on all night, he was, in the act, a gentle and considerate lover. But Lisa was not prepared for Frank's becoming besotted with her and expecting that they would spend the whole time of his hiding out together, especially as there were times when it seemed clear that Frank was thinking of hiding out for the rest of his life. Lisa had her own life to live. She liked Frank Mitchell, but she was not in love with him. And nobody in the flat seemed to know what the twins' long-term plans for him were. According to Dixon, Reggie made one visit to Barking, in which he promised shiftily that Ronnie would pay Frank a visit soon, and Frank was to be taken and hidden out in the country. According to Dixon, everyone present except naive Frank suspected that something much more sinister was being planned. According to Reggie, Dixon was telling a pack of lies which were simply intended to incriminate him. Lenny Dunn was increasingly unhappy with the arrangement, which was keeping him away from his bookstall and losing him Christmas trade far in excess of the £500 he had been promised. Scotch Jack wanted to get up to Edinburgh for Christmas and Hogmanay. Billy Exley was by now unhappy with the whole deal. On December the 23rd, Albert Donoghue came round and held a private conference with Frank, from which the Axeman emerged rejoicing that the twins had said Lisa could go with him into hiding. Lisa looked distinctly green. In the evening, Albert came in again to say that the van was there to take Frank away. The gentle giant had to be coaxed away from Lisa with promises that she would be following and then he got into the van. Almost immediately, Lisa, Scotch Jack and Lenny heard five shots. Frank Mitchell has never been seen again. When the twins were tried for his murder, the case against them was obvious. As Reggie has now admitted, they organised Mitchell's escape and placed him in the safe house of a friend. Members of their firm looked after his needs. Blonde Lisa subsequently became Albert Donoghue's girlfriend. Mitchell disappeared under suspicious circumstances while in the hands of the Cray firm, and there were none of the punitive repercussions that might have been expected if gang members had taken the law into their own hands and killed their leader's friend without permission. It has been alleged that mad Teddy Smith and Billy Exley both made the kind of disappearance from their customary haunts that was the practice of firm members when the heat was on. Teddy Smith, indeed, seems to have disappeared permanently. But the Crays were found not guilty of Mitchell's murder, and they and their allies have extended this verdict to the conclusion or claim that they have been shown to have had nothing to do with it. What really has been shown? First, the twins certainly did not kill Frank personally. Scotchy and Barry was with Ronnie in Finchley throughout the time that Mitchell disappeared. Reggie believed he was being tailed by the police at the time and was accordingly behaving with extreme discretion. Next, apart from Mad Teddy Smith, every one of the people involved in minding Frank Mitchell in the Barking Flat gave evidence against the twins at one point or another in the various trials. And Mr Justice Melford Stevenson, a hanging judge who would have been delighted to send the twins down if he could, made it perfectly clear to the jury that he thought they had heard a good deal of self-interested lying from some of the prominent prosecution witnesses. So one must agree it really would have been unsafe to convict the twins of that murder. As the Scots would say, it was, at the most suspicious, not proven. But Reggie Cray and Tony Lambrianu 
have both said who they believe did the actual shooting. Though their most intense rage against the betraying grasses is levelled at Scotch Jack Dixon, they do not accuse him. Both say they have heard that Billy Exley pulled the trigger. Both aver that this filtered back to them later, or they learned it through the grapevine. A truly amazing state of uncertainty for one of the gang's leaders and his recently inducted leading lieutenant. But both make very interesting additions. Reggie Cray says he heard that Frank was shot by Billy Exley and three Greeks. Tony Lambrianu says that Billy Exley lied in the trials about the Cornell murder, but not necessarily, one infers, Frank Mitchell. It sounds to me as though, even after all is over and done, and no fresh charges can be brought, dishonour among thieves still reigns. And these two men are quietly threatening each other with what they might say, be it true or false, should either overstep some unspecified limit. Jack McVitie was a petty criminal and a bad one. He was a drunk and a loudmouth and generally unreliable. His main concern was to get hold of enough money for his next evening's drinking. He didn't plan ahead, didn't calculate the consequences of his actions, reckoned from experience in the rough and tough East End that as long as he made threatening noises, he need fear no serious reprisals from those he cheated and let down. This was a bad mistake in criminal society that was coming under the domination of the more methodical, businesslike and ambitious Cray twins. Especially since they had made their image-building a major part of their operation. Image building that gave them a high public profile as good-hearted businessmen club owners, always willing to put their hands in their pockets for charity, always willing to draw celebrities into pubs or clubs for lively parties. Rough diamonds, but clean and presentable friends of the famous. That was one side of the image. That was the image they loved to project, entertaining Judy Garland and Sophie Tucker and Sonny Liston. Cameras flashed as they visited boys' clubs and handed out largesse to youngsters who were following in their footsteps and making their way up through the noble art of self-defence. And the Cray twins used the physical force at their command to punish bullies and rapists and granny bashers when the victims complained to them. But the other side of their image building, protecting their standing among fellow villains, was the image of being the toughest, the most ruthless, the most cold-hearted enemies a man could wish to make. Men who would shoot a henchman in the foot if they were angered by him who would shoot a mark if he didn't come up with as much money as they wanted, who were only prevented from killing by followers who would sometimes deflect their aim and turn potential murder into GBH, with the threat that murder would follow if the victim complained. Men who were not afraid to murder when they lost their tempers and the death of an offensive rival suited them. Ronnie Cray had openly killed George Cornell in the Blind Beggar pub, and the only retribution exacted in the intimidated East End was that Mrs. Cornell shied a brick through the Cray family's window in Valance Road. Big Frank Mitchell, the mad axeman, had disappeared mysteriously while in the hands of the Cray firm after they had sprung him from Dartmoor. And while the twins themselves were not directly responsible, Nobody doubted that Frank had paid the ultimate price for somehow getting out of line while apparently under their protection. Jack McVitie was playing with fire when he let his reckless dishonesty and irresponsibility spill over into his dealings with the twins.
1967 was a very unhappy year for Reggie Cray. Two years earlier, he had married beautiful young Frances Shea, and everyone who knew him agrees that he adored her. They agree, too, that he treated her well, though I'm not sure exactly what that means in the context of the extreme macho and male chauvinist society of the East End. The fly in the ointment, as far as Reggie was concerned, was her family, who did not approve of him and urged Francis to leave him. He felt, and feels, that she was subjected to an unwarrantable tug of love, that she would have liked to stay with him, but could not stand up to her parents, who persuaded her to leave him and return home to them. I think Francis had deeper internal personal problems than either her family or Reggie Cray recognised. I think her unhappiness must have run deeper than her strained affections in a marriage that her family deplored. For in 1967, she took an overdose of sleeping pills and killed herself. It seems tragic that those who loved her so much blame each other for this. Reggie blaming the chaise, the chaise blaming him. For her to go to that length, there must have been deep contributory factors for which neither could be held entirely responsible. But there is no doubt that her suicide hit Reggie very hard, and he was in an unusually morose and dangerous mood thereafter. His unpredictable temper was more dangerous than ever, and those who crossed him risked a spontaneous, explosive loss of control which might easily turn lethal. I think this is far more important than the often alleged claim that Ronnie was egging him on to kill someone with the words, I've done mine, you've got to do yours. The twins often quarrelled fraternally with each other, though they never fought physically. And no doubt, like all close and quarrelling couples, they said in the heat of the moment things that went beyond their considered judgment. Ronnie might well have taunted Reggie with the fact that none of the bullets he had put into enemies had resulted in death. But I don't think either of them seriously felt that Reggie was under an obligation to kill somebody just to keep up and even the score. In the way they were carrying on, it was surely predictable that Reg was going to do just that sooner or later. Against this lowering background, Jack McVitie stumbled on in his reckless way. With incredible folly, he double-crossed the twins a couple of times. He nicked part of a load of clandestine goods he was supposed to be delivering from a former Cray associate called Nobby Clark. Clark paid for that misadventure with a bullet through the foot. McVitie accepted the down payment on a contract to shoot another former associate called Payne, whom the twins suspected of cheating them. The advance was small enough, a couple of hundred pounds, that it's unlikely that anybody seriously expected he would kill Payne. But Jack just made off with the money, and imprudently boasted that he'd made a monkey of the famous craze. He might be a small villain, but he was getting seriously out of line. It is very bad for a big, bad gangland boss to have his tail tweaked by a little crook. Jack Spot's domination of London crime never really recovered from his being stabbed by the petty criminal Albert Dimes. Dimes should have died for Spot to stay entrenched at the top. Jack the Hat would have to go. McVitie was nicknamed Jack the Hat, as I expect you already know, because he was sensitive about his premature baldness and always wore a hat. One writer says it was a bowler, which surely would have made him stand out as old-fashioned and a little eccentric in his particular circles. Certainly he was wearing a trilby on the night of his death. By 1967, 
his unpredictable drunken behaviour was a public nuisance. He would pull out guns and shoot them at random in the pubs and clubs where criminals just wanted a quiet evening without any violence. He threatened one club owner with an axe, not for any good reason, just because he was drunk. He ruined Dorothy Squire's act at another club by shouting at her and pulling off his trousers and starting a fight with the bouncers. He quarrelled noisily with a club girl called Blonde Vicky and called her a slag, though her boyfriend, Ronnie Hart, was the crazed cousin. Yet when the end came, it seems to have been because of the spontaneous overflow of Reggie Cray's strained temper. On the 27th of October, the night before McVitie was murdered, he had a meal at the Regency Club in Stoke Newington with Reggie's minder, Albert Donoghue, and the Cray firm's fairly recently recruited smart young lieutenant, Tony Lambrianu. And Lambrianu, at least, was quite unaware that McVitie was under any threat. Nor did it seem to him that Donoghue sensed Jack the Hat as a particular enemy of the firm, as George Cornell certainly had been. The following night, Lambrianu went to the Regency Club again. Jack the Hat was also there, and came over and had a drink with him. Then, Lambrianu was quietly called into the office where Reggie Cray was waiting. He had been drinking, and Lambrianu, who knew his moods well, felt that he was menacing. Reggie gave directions that Jack was to be brought to Blonde Carol Skinner's basement flat in nearby Evering Road, under the pretext of a party. Scotch Jack Dixon, the firm member who turned against the Crays and gave evidence against them at their trial, has suggested that invitations to Cray twins' parties were dangerous, because they often meant somebody was going to be severely punished in a quiet place. But McVitie was quite unsuspicious, and so, unfortunately for them, were Tony Lambrianu's brother Chris, and a pair of brothers called Mills, who were out with the Lambrianus. Tony couldn't mark their cards that all was not well without giving the game away to Jack the Hat. So all five piled into a big Ford Zephyr and drove to Blonde Carol's place. It has often been said that Jack bounded down the stairs shouting, Where's the booze and the broads? It would be in keeping with the mood Lambrianu reports him as being in, though it is not recorded by any of the people involved who have since written about the murder. Tony Lambrianu was convicted of being accessory to it, has served his time, and has written his account. He saw everything that happened, and has nothing to gain from distorting at this point. So I assume his version is as good as we'll ever get. It differs markedly from some of the evidence given at the trial, and Lambrianu's inclination is to put this down to the sheer malice and self-interest of the lying slags who grasped. I'd prefer to allow for the traumatic effect of a violent crisis, which affects memory all round, and means that one should expect to hear differing stories from eyewitnesses to murders. But I still find Lambrianu's account more persuasive than that offered by prosecution witnesses. He says that the first person to greet the drunk McVitie was Ronnie Cray, who cursed him and opened a cut under his eye with a sherry glass, after which Ronnie moved away and took no further part in the proceedings. Jack the Hat did not, according to Lambrianu, try to jump through the window. He just smashed his hand through a pane of glass in fury at this unprovoked attack. And he did it before Reggie Cray pulled a pistol and tried to shoot him. It is confirmed, however, that Reggie's gun jammed, and he had to pick up a carving knife and stab McVitie. The notorious piece of dialogue... Die like a man, to which McVitie is supposed to have responded, I'll be a man, but I don't want to die like one, is not recalled 
by any of those most directly involved. There is dispute as to whether Ronnie Cray or Ronnie Hart shouted encouragement to Reg. It's not really very important. It is perhaps more to the point that Lambriano insists that McVitie evinced surprise, but no real fear, and probably never thought that he was seriously going to be killed. And it is interesting that Lambriano, a man who had happily lived by and with violence for most of his adult life, found the scene sordid and sickening, and still believes that Reggie Cray was not in his right mind when he did it. That final belief may be the key to the whole Cray twins mythos. Nobody, not even Ronnie himself, has ever denied that the man who called himself the Colonel was capable of dangerous and lethal fits of paranoid rage if he was not kept on heavy medication. But I think that the other twin, the natural businessman, was also slightly unbalanced, also capable of becoming quite irrationally dangerous when under stress his mind just tipped over. I've often remarked that mad is a complimentary term for a villainous enforcer who is capable of berserk rages since it makes him especially dangerous. Mad Frankie Fraser and Mad Teddy Smith are two great examples from London in the Cray Twins sixties. But maybe, in a more literal sense, the twins achieved their bad eminence, because in flashes they really were Mad Ronnie and Mad Reggie Cray. Everyone knows what followed. Just as Jack the Hat had gone too far for the underworld to tolerate, so the twins were going too far for law-abiding society. The party and the Metropolitan Police that had long wanted a special task force to get the craze were given their wish. Superintendent Leonard Reed headed it. Someone in Scotland Yard archives remarked to me recently that they were a little perturbed by the number of crime writers who casually ring them up asking for details of Nipper Reed as though they were old personal friends of the retired superintendent. Other very senior officers, Gerard, Mooney and La Rose, helped. Ronnie Cray's insouciant purchase of a pair of snakes, which he called Gerard and Reed, was completely misplaced confidence. The task force, working quietly out of Tintagel House rather than the yard itself, went steadily about its business, talking to witnesses finding out who had to be under lock and key before they dared give their testimony. Until at last, in 1968, came the great dawn raid. The bulk of the firm was behind bars. The witnesses came out of the woodwork. The barmaid said what had happened in the blind beggar. There's still intense anger among the loyal members of the firm about those who gave evidence against them and the extent to which they fingered people wrongly. Tony Lambrianu insists that he drove away Jack McVitie's body and Charlie Cray and Freddie Foreman were quite wrongly convicted of that accessory activity. Charlie has certainly protested strongly that his conviction was misplaced but I have heard professional villains who liked Charlie and admired him for his lasting loyalty to his little twin brothers aver, nevertheless, that Charlie doth protest too much, that he may have restricted himself largely to doing the firm's accounts, but he knew jolly well that the money was actually coming out of violence and murderous violence at that. And although Tony Lambriano is right to insist that he and his brother didn't actually kill McVitie, he's honest enough to say that once Reggie had made a lethal assault on him, they would have had to finish the job if Reggie didn't. Otherwise, Jack would have tried to kill them later. That's the way they all lived, he suggests. Jack knew the world of crime. 
He should have known perfectly well that he was out of order and asking to be killed. We only killed each other, might be Tony Lambrianu's motto, with the unspoken corollary, so why don't you leave us alone? Now, I don't want the remorse the courts always want criminals to exhibit to take the form of breast-beating penitence and maudlin tears of regret for their sins. I don't want a set of Uriah heaps sitting in our jails saying how humble they are now and how grateful they are to the law for showing them the wickedness of their ways. But I would like it if rehabilitated criminals like Charlie Cray and Tony Lambrianu showed just a little understanding of ordinary citizens' needs, our surely justifiable wish that the creeping poison of intimidation and corruption should be barred as a form of business competition, our refusal to accept that only those brave enough to resist intimidation and sufficiently free from greed to refuse corruption can be allowed to stay out of their clutches. And when people ask me whether I don't think Reggie Cray should be released as soon as possible, I'm torn. I don't like to see any fellow human being banged up unless he's a manifest and intolerable danger to other people. And I don't really think Reggie is that now. But I do wish Reggie Cray didn't feel quite so complacently convinced that everyone he ever whacked thoroughly deserved it. And the murder of Jack the Hat was nobody else's business. Still, in a few years, the parole board will make its decisions about Reggie. And maybe he'll emerge as a conservative historic figure, commenting in crime on chat shows and local radio. But Ronnie Cray, as I think even he accepts, will most likely spend the rest of his life with his paranoia being treated as a gracious and charming host to guests who visit him in his incarceration in Broadmoor. If you enjoyed the video, please join our Facebook group. It's called Craze Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you.